Welcome everyone. Hello, I'm Mike Schoon, broadcasting from Cuenca, Ecuador. Apologies a bit for the feral look that I have going here. It's uh, week seven or eight or something like that in quarantine here. Um, together with uh, Marco Janssen and Marty Andres, we're hosting the third webinar on Don't Waste the COVID-19 Crisis from ASU Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment, co-sponsored by the Resilience Alliance and the International Association for the Study of the Commons. We're delighted to have uh, Simon Levin here with us today from Princeton University. Um, Simon is the James McDonald Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution and the Director of the Center for Biocomplexity at Princeton. Uh, he's also the namesake for um, for ASU's Simon Levin Mathematical, Computational, and Modeling Sciences Center. Today's format, Simon's going to be presenting, talking for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open this up for questions. Please submit your questions through the Q&A format, and we will give those questions to Simon. Without uh, further ado, let me turn it over uh, to him. Thanks, Simon. Very good. Can you hear me? Thank you for, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back in Tempe, even virtually. Um, so Marty and Marco um, asked me to uh, talk a little more broadly about extreme events, something that Marty and I have been working on, uh, and then to um, bring that back to the, to the COVID-19 crisis. So the title of my talk is uh, Lessons from Evolution for Anticipating and Coping with Extreme Events. And first of all, I want to thank the uh, various um, foundations uh, and other sources that have funded this work. So one of the greatest challenges that's facing any society is how to deal with extreme events. Uh, the um, pandemic we're dealing with is not the first um, and it won't be the last, but um, uh, it's something that revisits us uh, and uh, we have to learn to deal with. And I want to talk a lot about what extreme events are and whether they're increasing in frequency. In fact, Marty and I have been in, and I'll refer to this paper a couple of times, um, under the sponsorship of the Bayer Institute, part of the Swedish Academy, trying to understand what sorts of governance regimes might be most effective in dealing with extreme events. And this is just the beginning of a, a, a paper that we're working on, uh, in which we, we look at uh, parallels between um, what goes on in biology, what goes on in natural selection, and the sorts of problems the societies are facing. So for a society, the challenge in general is to avoid systems collapse. And the reason I say in general is not all transitions and transformations of societies and, and, and systems are bad. Sometimes we're stuck in a rut and we want to get out. But for today, we're largely going to be focusing on the sorts of things that Martin Schaeffer talks about in his book, Critical Transitions in Nature and Society, and those that you want to avoid, like the collapse of civilizations. There are lots of places where we're dealing with these sorts of um, extreme events and possible transitions. There may be tipping points in the climate systems. Uh, there may be losses of biodiversity. Stock markets crash, we know that. Uh, we've seen that in all of our lifetimes. S challenges of this sort are the norm over evolutionary time. And sometimes, as in the case of these species, which none of us has seen in person, they result uh, in extinctions. But extinction is not the only or perhaps even the usual evolutionary outcome. Natural selection has shaped strategies like seed dispersal, which is a way of spreading the risks, a kind of insurance policy for dealing with environmental unpredictability, for dealing with the fact that at any particular site, we may be faced with an extreme event, but there are ways around it. There, and we'll talk about a variety of ways that evolution has dealt with this problem. What you see illustrated here is just one in which one distributes seeds over many different habitats, some of which will face extreme events and some of which won't. Indeed, some of them might f um, experience extreme events that are very favorable. Uh, and so this is one strategy for dealing with it. A paper that I found very influential uh, and helpful 
now published almost 50 years ago by Larry Slobotkin and Anatole Rappaport, Slobotkin, a great ecologist, and Rappaport, a game theorist, uh, is called an optimal strategy of evolution. Uh, and the picture that you see here, here is one I'm going to come back to, and I think runs through a lot of um, the lessons I'd like to uh, derive today, which is that when faced with an environmental perturbation, uh, the first thing an organism does um, is some behavioral change. Uh, I'm wearing a, a, a vest to keep me warmer. Uh, if that doesn't work, I may go to something a, a little more dramatic, um, like um, shivering. So some basically physiological um, response. If this goes on for a longer period of time, I may have to engage in some sort of acclimatization. Um, and if that doesn't work, we get more and more dramatic things. Death rates may begin to increase. Um, then evolution may come in, leading to genetic changes. As we go down this list, these are there's a hierarchy of responses of um, increasing severity and decreasing reverse ability. And so that's the picture. That's how evolution largely has dealt with events. The, the first responses are reversible um, and getting less so as we go down the list. So we'll come back to this a few times. Now, one question we have to confront is what do we mean when we talk about an extreme event? This is a paper that uh, a distinguished ASU um, faculty member is involved with, Nancy Grimm, um, published in the AGU. It just, how do you define extreme events? And I'm not going to take a particular answer out of this. I, I want to point out that it's not so obvious as one might think, and for the reasons I'm going to go into now. So in, in their paper, they identify a, a number of events largely in um, dealing with climate and climate related things. And on the vertical axis um, is the number of such events uh, with major costs to the US economy of a billion dollars. That's one way to measure what an extreme event is. You notice here, the only measure, at least on this graph, is the, um, is the magnitude of the impact on society. But sometimes when you look at the literature, you'll find another criterion, which is extreme events are events of low probability and of high impact. Are both of these things necessary? Well, in a lot of the discussions Marty and I had with the Bayer group, um, there were many who insisted that, that we, extreme events meant things which were rare, that, that didn't happen very often. But there's a problem in definition here, as well as in practice. What once were low probability events are increasing in frequency. They're still extreme in, in relation to our um, evolutionary um, experiences and, 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 and things we've experienced in societies up till now. But for example, this shows you um, from two years ago, the, the major flood in, um, in Houston, Texas. This was described as a 500 year flood, but it was the third one that they, the third 500 year flood uh, that they had had in three years. How is that possible? Shouldn't we still consider this an extreme event? Coronavirus isn't an outlier. Um, we're going to see more major outbreaks. We don't really know how to quantify this yet, um, but in our interconnect interconnected viral age, we're going to see more outbreaks. I, I need to study this, the background of this um, graph a little bit better. I took this off the web. Uh, and it's kind of a crude measure, but it comes from the WHO and from Harvard's Global Health Institute and the World Economic Forum. This is the number of countries experiencing significant disease outbreaks. Now, um, as my students have pointed out to me, measuring things in terms of the number of countries, which puts um, China uh, next to Luxembourg um, at, at the same level, is maybe not the most sensitive indicator. But there are two things I found interesting on this graph. Um, the reason I took it to begin with is the great increase in the number of significant disease outbreaks uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, what's more puzzling, perhaps, is that the, um, 
um, is the decline that took place between 1996 and 2010, a steady decline down. Well, now, what the reasons for, for this are, are, are not that clear. Um, one hypothesis is there were great increases in vaccine distribution um, in the first decade of this millennium. Um, and then vaccine hesitancy came in and, there, and we're seeing measles outbreaks and things of that sort in many places around the world. Maybe that accounts for some of this. There was also a global crisis, economic crisis, we know in 2008, that began in 2008. So maybe that had some um, bearing on this. Whatever, um, I think it, we need to be prepared for um, that, recognizing that what we're experiencing with COVID-19 now is not gonna be so unusual. These are extreme events, but they're happening more frequently. frequently. So on, on our, in our paper, not yet complete, we try to classify this with two axes. On one axis, the probability of the event, uh, and on the other axis, the impact of the event. And you can see how we've tried to place things um, on this graph. But one of the things that I think is happening um, is that the arrow certainly is moving to the right for many of the sorts of impacts that we're face facing, even given a, 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 the same level of impact the frequencies, fires in the Western United States, for example, may be increasing. Based on our experience, these are still, by our definition, extreme events. And they don't occur independently of one another. Um, this um, from a, I don't even know whether this is a talk still to be given in a few days, but worrying about the fact that uh, these extreme events uh, can lead to cascading risks. And in fact, led by my former postdoc, Juan Rotra, uh, at the Stockholm Resilience Center, and together with Gary Peterson and Orjan Bodin, we published a paper in Science a few years ago, looking at a number of what we call regime shifts of various kinds um, across multiple scales and trying to look for linkages and cascades. So these extreme events don't occur independently. They may, they may be driven by a common driver or they may be the result of cascading events in which one um, extreme event triggers another, et cetera. So how do we deal with this? Well, we can learn a great deal from nature about how to respond to extreme events. That's my argument. Uh, and to ask questions like what makes systems robust or resilient? Um, what leads to critical transitions and what mechanisms have, have emerged over evolutionary time and through self-organization that make systems more robust? Well, here's one of the early examples in which we drew on ecological analogies. Um, my late colleague, Bob May, who sadly passed away a few weeks ago, uh, and George Sugahara, a former student of Bob's and I, published a paper in 2008, six months before the financial crisis, in which we said, um, as ecologists, if, if we look at the interconnectedness of banking systems and compare them, compare, um, or compare that with the interconnectedness of ecological systems, when we see such interconnectedness in ecology, we worry um, that the system is ripe for collapse. Um, and if we were involved with financial regulations, we'd be worried. We wrote, who knows, for instance, how the present concern over subprime loans will pan out? Well, we know now. It was just about six months later after we published our paper that the markets collapsed. Um, not our fault, I don't think. Um, and the idea was this was an analogy, a systems approach drawing from ecological and biological experiences to learn something about other sorts of uh, systems. Part of the reason for this was, I think, a breakdown between the feedback loops that regulate systems. Um, High-speed trading, algorithmic trading, um, got ahead of the regulatory system. Um, I'm, I'm writing a paper now with Roberto Romano at Yale about um, 
the benefits of, of sunsetting for regulations in, the, in uh, dealing with financial markets uh, because otherwise we get locked into solutions that worked years ago but no longer work. But we'd never be able to keep up with algorithmic trading. Uh, we're, we're probably not going to get regulatory responses that are fast enough. And that's why it's been often proposed uh, to, to assess a tax of perhaps one cent per share on trading so that for most people that wouldn't make any difference at all. But for someone trading a million shares a day, it'd be a sufficient to turn and slow things down. The importance here is that the regulatory feedbacks um, have evolved, and I use that term not in a biological sense, to occur on appropriate scales to the stimuli, uh, and, and that can result in robust regulation. But when that breaks down, uh, the system gets out of hand. There's a biological example, again, um, there are lots of biological examples, but we have lots of regulatory uh, loops in our bodies uh, to keep our physiological systems working well. Uh, one breakdown of that is something called change Stokes breathing, in which the feedback loop um, is delayed. Uh, and then instead of maintaining normal breathing, uh, the patient um, oscillates between very rapid breathing, which you see at, in, at the left there, followed by apnea. Uh, that is the, basically stopping breathing. And uh, this goes back and forth uh, and it's life threatening. So the breakdown of the food like, feedback loops, a mismatch of scales. And th that's one of the lessons from biology and one that Andy Lowe at MIT and I have been advocating in, in, in our joint work going back to this uh, paper that appeared a few years ago um, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, drawing on analogies from biology uh, for dealing with regulating financial systems. Well, dealing with extreme events is dealing with unpredictability. And unpredictability is, in fact, the most important feature of future environments, both in social systems and in biology. It's actually what drives a lot of evolutionary processes. How do organisms and genomes deal with uncertainties? Societies also have to be adaptive just like the influenza virus has been. I'm going to come back and talk about the influenza virus in a while, but influenza A has a very high mutation rate, and that's the explanation of how it's managed to hang around as long as it has. I'll come back to those. Um, I, to, to me, the most impressive evolutionary response to unpredictability is the vertebrate immune system. Um, because it has evolved to deal with the fact that we will be confronted um, predictably with a variety of pathogens over our lifetime. What's not predictable is exactly what those will be uh, and when they will occur. So we've developed some very broad defenses, firewalls basically, like skin and mucous membranes uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, and, and then we've developed a hierarchy, just like in the Slobotkin and Rappaport paper, uh, a hierarchy of responses um, to viruses and to bacteria. First of, all, first of all, we have to have ways to rec recognize that there's a problem involved. We have an innate immune system not tuned to the particular um, uh, threat but to the fact that there's a threat at all. There was an article that was just reported. Um, today I read about it um, in the Scientist magazine that many people are, are responding to COVID infections with by killer T cells, a, a very generalized responses. And that doesn't give them lifetime immunity or, or long range immunity, but it might help us to, de to design vaccines to deal with it. So then we have very generalized rapid responses, macrophages, the physical barriers are already talked about, inflammation, which we know about, um, um, which can get out of hand, et cetera. Those are not tuned to the particular um, pathogen, but they buy us time. I want us to understand uh, 
also that that's one of the big advantages of social distancing. It's not a long-term solution, but it buys us time to come up with antivirals and ultimately, hopefully, with the vaccine. And that can be important in terms of not overloading the healthcare system. And then on a longer time scale, we develop specialized adaptive responses, lymphocytes, um, antibodies, et cetera, which then may provide us some memory uh, so that um, down the line, when we're tested again, uh, we still have resistance. Um, as I mentioned, Andy Lowe and I have been arguing for developing immune systems for financial systems. I, I mentioned the paper in PNES before. This was a, a, an article we had in the Christian Science Monitor where we developed this idea in a little more detail. It's not a new idea. Marco John Johnson, who um, is one of the hosts for this, um, actually wrote a paper 20 years ago almost, um, laying out the idea of immune system perspectives on ecosystem management. Several people have talked about these ideas. Nobody's actually formalized this, uh, and I'm hoping that we can begin to do this now. So what leads to robustness in these sorts of complex systems? In fact, complex adaptive systems, systems made up of lots of individual agents. Uh, this is an idea I developed also about 20 years ago in my book, Fragile Dominion. Um, if you look at natural systems, at social systems, at business systems, and those that are long lived, by the way, you'll see on here, uh, Kungo Gumi, this is the oldest business system on here, it was more than 1400 years old. Um, it designed Zen temples. They decided to diversify, they went out of business. So that's no longer the longest, com oldest company on here. But the, all of these long lived systems share common principles. And I wanna explore some of those. So how do you get robustness in complex adaptive systems? Well, think about organisms living in a, um, in, in, in a rather stressful marine environment, lots of turbulence, lots of waves. One way to deal with this is by being like a coral, rigid design, robust components. Another way is to be like a bull kelp and go with the flow. It's not that one of these strategies is better than the other. They both coexist. We know that. Uh, so there are different strategies for different times. Rigid design might work best over short time scales. Polaroid explored that or in relatively constant environments, but nobody buys Polaroid cameras anymore. Flexible design like Nikon used for their cameras may work best over long time scales or in fluctuating environments. In changing environments, as Lewis Carroll told us, you have to just keep running like the Red Queen just to stay in place. Um, and that's getting back to the influenza virus. That's what the influenza virus has done. And one has to understand the levels uh, at which responses are taking place. The influenza virus has been around for millennia, but individual strains come and go as societies develop uh, resistance to them. It's the ability to replace the surface antigens, hemagglutinin, and the, it's, I'm sorry, the surface proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, that, um, um, that allows the virus to escape the immune system. And so we see that having robustness at one level may require the absence of robustness uh, at lower levels. Uh, and so influenza A goes through annual fluctuations. Um, it goes through a variety of different fluctuations uh, on different scales due to reassortment events and things of that sort. But it's all because of its high mutation and reassortment rates that have allowed it to survive. So what are the key features of robustness? I laid these out first in, in my book that I already mentioned, uh, but they're not new. But one of them is just an idea that comes from evolutionary biology, is the maintenance of diversity and heterogeneity, which includes the variation to explore new solutions and provides adaptive capacity. And so um, much interest in maintaining that sort of diversity in our agricultural systems, but also um, in conservation biology more generally. Uh, secondly, um, is what Paul and Ann Ehrlich pointed out in terms of the rivets on an airplane, the importance of redundancy and degeneracy. 
the last time, or perhaps not quite the last time, we had a major uh, a, a, a crisis with involving um, a viral pandemic was um, a, about a decade or so ago when influenza A was expected to, to be a major problem in that season. And one of the companies making the vaccine uh, found out that their vaccine was tainted. So we lost a lot of the redundancy we had in the system. Fortunately, it was not a bad year for the flu. And the other company was able to keep producing the vaccine. But the absence of that sort of redundancy, degeneracy, by the way, means um, not an identical element, but some other uh, agent that can provide the same functionality. Um, so redundancy is an important part of the ability of a system um, to maintain itself and be resilient or robust in the face of perturbations. Obviously, diversity and redundancy trade off against each other. Building in redundancy reduces diversity. So finding the sweet spot between them is important. The other thing which I've emphasized um, is modularity. And that's what we're doing now with social distancing. If a system is too interconnected, and that's where I began this lecture, um, then it's subject to systemic risk, contagious spread. But by creating fire breaks between units, by um, building in separation uh, um, between households, among households, um, et cetera, um, that doesn't help us perhaps within a particular compartment, but it pre prevents uh, the event from, from taking down the whole system. So diversity, redundancy, and modularity all have to work together to maintain the, the robustness of the system. And again, going back to the, to the evolutionary examples, modularity has arisen as a major contributor to evolutionary change. Uh, it creates building blocks. Uh, it prevents um, the collapse of whole systems, but also allows rapid adaptation to new conditions. And the final thing I'll mention in this category is cooperation and collective action, whether we're talking about uh, um, leaf cutter ants or a pardon for the noise there, or these starlings with this uh, wonderful picture. Um, it's the ability of individuals to work together for the collective good that allows societies to, to survive when they couldn't otherwise. Ecosystems and the biosphere are complex systems. Indeed, they are complex adaptive systems. That means they're heterogeneous collections of individual units that interact locally, and, the, and those systems evolve based on the outcomes of those interactions, but not just ecological systems, but socioeconomic systems, stock markets, uh, and the systems in which the ecological systems are embedded. Indeed, ecology and economics are two sides of the same coin with competition for resources, exploitation, uh, and cooperation. And it's not an accident that e the two words begin with the same three letters. They come from the same root. So from microbial systems to socioeconomic systems, like in these um, flocks of starlings, there's one hawk in there, which when I run it again, perhaps you'll pick up. Macroscopic patterns emerge from microscopic uh, interactions. And these systems uh, are characterized by the fact that things, dynamics play out on multiple spatial, temporal, and organizational scales. The systems undergo self-organization, and that makes the outcomes unpredictable. There are potentially multiple stable states, such as Martin Skeffer is talking about. Um, the system can flip from, flip from uh, an oligotrophic uh, lake to a eutrophic lake, from a healthy economy to a recession or a depression, um, et cetera. And that means there will be what's called path dependence, meaning once you get locked in, uh, it may be harder to get off uh, on another trajectory. Uh, and hysteresis, a related notion, contagious spread and systemic risk, and the potential that these systems will become destabilized through evolution taking place. And that just means um, 
time-dependent changes on slower time scales. So how does this relate to dealing with the current pandemic? Well, evolution has selected for robustness in the face of extreme events. That must be the case or else organisms and their genomes couldn't survive. Some of what we see as survival may evolve higher levels, like in the case of uh, influenza where individual strains disappear, but whole subtypes, collections of individual strains survive. Or maybe even this plays out in dealing with whole communities um, in feedback loops in which species A depends on species B, et cetera. Some of that might occur through selection, but probably it has more to do uh, with self-organization in that societies that don't have those characteristics don't hang around very long. But just because we're talking about robustness doesn't mean we're talking about stasis. In fact, as we saw with influenza, variation and exploitation, exploration are, are the essential features that allow uh, adaptation. And so um, persistence um, may require, may depend upon um, dynamic change at lower levels. And I don't have time to go into it, but this is possibly at the root of much debate about whether diversity um, leads to stability in ecological systems. I'd be happy to talk about that in the discussion period. So going back to the lessons that I've tried to draw out today, dealing with the pandemic, going back to the Slobodkin and Rappaport slide, um, means that the individual changes that in dealing with them will be the things we can do easily, most reversibly. Behavioral changes like social distancing, telling people to stay home, to wear masks, etc. If that doesn't work, then we may need to build in longer term ch changes in, in our society. And if we fail at that, we're, um, we're gonna end up with excessive mortality, which is why those initial changes were, were, were built in with broader consequences. So to me, this matches exactly what Slobodkin and Rappaport talked about nearly 50 years ago. This hierarchy of reversibility. Um, measures for robustness have to be invoked at multiple levels of organization. We take steps to make ourselves robust, to keep ourselves healthy. Uh, we have other steps to make societies healthy. Hopefully these work in concert, but they don't always. Um, and these are global problems. Um, we need appropriate feedback loops so that when we begin to open up the economy again, we can't just do it willy-nilly. Testing and contact tracing are going to be essential. They're going to provide the feedback that allows us to make the behavioral responses and if necessary, shut things down again. Hopefully not. But I can't emphasize um, and strongly, perhaps as I need to, the importance of testing and contact tracing in terms of reopening the economy. Collective action is going to be important as well. This map, which is just from two days ago, shows the global spread of the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 so far. You'll see that it hasn't yet um, reached high proportions in Africa, but if you've been reading the news, you know that that's coming. Uh, Africa is beginning to see their outbreaks. It's going to spread. No, the virus does not know boundaries, and no nation can deal with this themselves. So it's no accident that I put the World Health Organization at the top. For whatever mistakes they may or may not make, this sort of global cooperation is the only way we're going to be able to deal with this crisis. We need an immune system for dealing with pandemics, starting at the low level with just preparedness getting prepared for the next pandemic, then early generalized responses like quarantine, that as I argued, bias time, the development of antigen specific responses like vaccines, and by the way, the buying time um, will also allow us to develop uh, antivirals and things that deal um, with sickness more effectively. Um, and of course we have to worry about not over responding finding the right balance, finding the right planning for reopening. In, in the case of the immune system, an over-response leads to what are called cytokine storms that can make people very sick. Um, 
largely because of an over response to the immune system. Um, and finally, we need collective action. So um, just a couple more uh, comments um, the, the, on the redundancy. The, um, obviously, people are stocking up on toilet paper uh, or have been. I don't think that's the kind of stockpiling of materials um, that's going to be most effective, but, um, but ventilators, uh, we needed more ventilators. We're getting uh, improvement there, but they should have been there to start with. That's a redundancy in the system. Built, getting stuff that you may never use. Developing multiple methods, quarantines, antivirals, vaccine, et cetera, to deal with, um, with the crisis. Uh, and having multiple um, companies um, looking for, uh, for vaccines, multiple producers, multiple modes of distribution. Uh, part of that must also be um, a diversity of approaches, multiple vaccine candidates, multiple timing of measures. Um, my students and I uh, have a paper um, led by Dylan Morris and Fernando Rossin, uh, which um, has appeared online in archive and is about to be submitted to a journal, uh, arguing that although the optimal measures for, um, for quarantine and release um, can be calculated if you knew everything about the virus, it turns out that if you misjudge um, the timing of those measures, you're much worse off than if you uh, adapt a, a measure that has multiple releases, multiple timing, steady uh, quarantine over longer periods of time. Um, in the face of uncertainty, uh, these are much better measures. Um, modularity, obviously something we've been practicing, or I hope we've all been practicing, in which individual families form modules uh, but minimize their, their interactions with others. So all of these lessons from biology and evolution, I think, uh, have been guiding and should guide our response to the epidemic. Globally, we will be increasingly be challenged to deal with extreme events in the, in the decades to come, some of them climatic, some of them economic, some of them cultural, and others. And I hope I've convinced you that drawing from biology and evolutionary perspectives um, can be very useful in informing our understanding um, as to how we might uh, respond. So that, that's all for my preliminary comments, and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions uh, or hear your criticisms. Great. Thanks, Simon. That was uh, both enjoyable and in informative. Um, Again, please uh, send your questions in through the Q&A format, and we'll go ahead and, and forward those on to, to Simon as, the, as they come in. To, to get things started, I wondered if you could go back to your, um, to your comment that diversity leads to stability, right? That, um, and I was wondering how you think or how you can study or what you would suggest for trying to understand in some kind of uh, systematic uh, or systemic uh, manner, rather, the response diversity of various countries. We've seen all kinds of things happen uh, when we compare Taiwan to Sweden to the U.S. and so on. And what you think about these, and is this is this uh, diversity of responses helping, or is the lack of uh, coordination hindering? How how do you uh, uh, put that into uh, some kind of manner for for understanding? Okay, well, first of all, the, the words diversity and stability are loaded. Um, and and, and I, I was careful not to say that diversity leads to stability. Uh, I said that uh, at, at the levels we're interested in, uh, that diversity can lead to robustness of systems. A lot of the debate um, in ecology about um, stability and robustness has differed between whether people were talking about um, the overall robustness of the system or the ability to maintain an equilibrium with the same species composition over periods of time. Uh, my example of the influenza, um, uh, the way it has survived um, was meant to, 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 to show that um, having a high diversity of, um, allows the, uh, that arises through mutation has allowed the virus to continue to respond uh, 
uh, and therefore um, the subtype of uh, various subtypes of influenza A and on longer timescales, influenza A uh, itself um, have persisted over long periods of time. Because they're made up of highly diverse assemblages of strains um, that replace one another. And so um, we do not, if we measured things by writing a set of equations and asking if there's an equilibrium that's stable, we would find that the more diverse the system, the harder it is to maintain stability. But um, perhaps paradoxically, that means the easier it is to, it might mean the easier it is to maintain stability uh, at higher levels um, in, in which we don't care exactly which, which strains are there. And we could apply the same thing to thinking about um, species and population survival. David Tillman's work um, in Cedar Creek in Minnesota shows that individual species abundances are highly fluctuating. They replace each other in the face of climate change um, and temp uh, local conditions, but, um, but the increased diversity leads to higher productivity in those systems. So you might regard that as paradoxical. Now to ter turn this to, um, but, but I don't. You, turning to your question about what this means about COVID-19, um, at one level, of course, we, um, we learn from um, diversity um, in that we see the experiences of different countries. And um, so there's a knowledge gain from that. But the lack of coordination, I think, um, has made it harder um, to control um, the virus. Um, my colleague, Brian Grenfell, has done a lot of work on measles outbreaks uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and the modeling work he's done shows that measles persists because it pops up uh, in Manchester and then dies down. Then it pops up in London, it dies down. Um, and then it pops up in Leeds and dies down. And so the lack of synchrony, the, the lack of synchrony between population, if you're thinking of it from the viewpoint of the virus is a good thing because it allows the virus to, um, to keep emerging in, in different places, but it makes it much harder to control. It's gonna make it much harder for us to control um, because it, even if you just look within the United States, the diversity of responses at different states and different locales means that, um, um, you, if you suppress it in one place, it pops up somewhere else, and then it, it's likely to come back. So, so that the diversity there, I think, makes the virus more robust, but it doesn't, it's not going to be helpful to us uh, in our response. We're, if, after all, we're not looking, in, in, in a certain sense, here for robustness. Uh, we had robustness before. We're dealing with a, a perturbed system, uh, and we want to get away from the perturbations due to the virus. So I, 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 I don't hold out any hope, uh, given international governance systems, that we're going to get an overall coordinated strategy. But I certainly think it makes it harder to develop a, a, a global strategy uh, for control of, 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 of the virus. The timing differences, uh, the outbreaks which would occur even with um, coordination also make it harder. So continuing with this topic on uh, trade-offs between uh, diversity and redundancy, um, how might these play out in, in the current pandemic response? Well, I, you know, I, I, in, in any particular situation, the trade-offs between those two has to be evaluated within the context of, of the specific measure you're dealing with. So a, as an example, you know early on, uh, there were various private companies and laboratories that were developing um, tests for, for, the, for the virus, uh, and they were uh, prevented from using those tests uh, because um, the CDC and FDA, I, I'm not sure where the responsibility lay there, wanted a uniform uh, test for the country, uh, and they came up with a flawed test, and that delayed uh, 
in devastating ways our ability to do testing. A, a, a better strategy at the start there would have, would have been to have a, a diversity of approaches. Um, there, there would be nothing to stop multiple tests, multiple kinds of tests to be um, uh, to be tried out, uh, even on on the same patients. There would have been some false results coming in, uh, but in the long run, we'd have been much better off by taking advantage of that um, diversity uh, of, of approaches. I think we are following that approach in the case of vaccine uh, development. I, it, I think it's led to a kind of competition between companies. You probably saw the good news this morning that Moderna's um, testing to date has showed great promise and that um, uh, they're going into planning to go quite early into broader scale testing. There are a lot of other companies uh, out there that are looking for, for vaccines. That's exactly what we ought to be doing at this point, um, exploring the diversity of, this, of, of, of the system uh, in, in order to, uh, just the, the way natural selection would do it, to make multiple candidates up there from which the ones that are most successful uh, will be the ones that we can um, select. Ultimately, we'll probably um, then reduce um, the, the, the number of vaccines out there. Those of you who are my age will remember the Salk and Sabin solutions to the problem. Um, they were both useful to have along the way. Um, it, it may well be that um, that we will eventually that some of the vaccines that come um, come to market will be highly successful, but hold um, uh, unacceptable um, consequences in in terms of. Um, second order effects for uh, some people, in which case they may have to use a different vaccine. Um, I, I think um, here's a case where, um, where um, not trying to focus initially, as, as, as happened with the test results, on a single solution um, that would be in, in, in which we'd um, produce uh, large numbers of copies, that's the redundancy part, uh, is what we ought to be doing at the start. It may be where we would move later, uh, but there's a trade-off here between the ability to mass produce and the ability to keep testing better, better solutions to the problem. I think we're going to be in a learning phase for a while. The initial vaccines may be um, less successful than ones that will come later, so we, we will need to keep exploring um, uh, for a long period of time. So that leads to a number of uh, a thread of questions that we're seeing pop up here on some of the uh, ethical issues. And so let me read this, this one. Um, uh, several people have said to me recently, we all have to get exposed to this at some point. I usually say, well, hopefully we have a vaccine by that point when more of us are exposed. Uh, they're less optimistic about the effectiveness of the vaccine because as one of them said, the virus has already mutated 15 times. So what do you think about the role of a sort of survival of the fit Darwinian approach to this as if COVID-19 is here to cull the herd in response to great human impacts on nature? Well, as you know, that's, a, that's basically the approach that's been tried in Sweden. Um, that's the approach that was originally proposed in the UK, build up herd immunity through um, uh, just exposing people. Uh, there are variants on that which say, well, expose everybody exp except the most vulnerable. Um, I think that approach, um, it's been demonstrated in Sweden, has had unacceptable consequences. Um, I, I think if we had, uh, we, we came close to that here uh, in terms of overloading hospitals, I think that would have been um, a, a devastating um, approach. Um, the, you raised a lot of interesting questions there. Um, in turn, the virus indeed has mutated a lot. Um, there, there, there are lots of data uh, on different variants in different countries, but no strong evidence that, that it has evolved in the direction of increased virulence. This is just natural mutation um, that occurs. If we come up with vaccines um, and build up um, and couple that with natural immunity to build up sufficient herd immunity, uh, 
there is the possibility, we don't know this yet, uh, but um, that it will be like influenza A, um, in which the virus evolves away from the immune systems and we have to keep getting uh, revaccinated every year. But there are lots of vaccines that we take for which we get boosters. In some cases, every 10 years. In the case of influenza, we, should, we do it every year because of the very high um, mutation rate of influenza A. But to me, that's, um, that's not an unacceptable uh, situation. We don't all have to get it. As far as I know, I haven't had influenza in the last 10 years because I get vaccinated every year. The vaccine is uh, uh, developing the appropriate vaccines to influenza A involves some educated guesswork. Don't always get it right, but usually if you've been vaccinated and you don't have complete protection and you get sick, you don't get as sick as you would if you hadn't been vaccinated. It certainly builds up some level of approximate herd immunity in the population. We may not reach the technical level of herd immunity for, for COVID-19 right now with, a, um, with an R0 um, of, of approximately, let's, let's say about three, you, you'd, have to, um, you, you'd have to be uh, vaccinating or having natural immunity in about two thirds of the population. Um, and even that doesn't mean nobody gets it. That means that the virus will not be spreading and there, you still have to take precautions. So I, I don't believe that um, everybody has to get it. I think ultimately we want to build up herd immunity. We will do that. Um, I've seen various estimates of what the, uh, about the disease immune immunity is. It's obviously very a great deal from place to place, but obviously there are a lot more asymptomatic cases uh, than we were initially aware of. Uh, my my best estimate is that um, that place lots of the places that we frequent. 15 to 20 percent of the population uh, has been exposed. We don't know yet whether that exposure means that they have antibodies uh, and long-term protection because uh, if these are being fought with killer T cells, then we probably are not building up um, immunity in, in, in those cases. But it's buying us time. Um, you, you, you've seen um, the the, the trials on drugs that can reduce the uh, infectious time uh, from, uh, or, the, or the affected time from 15 days to about 11 days. That doesn't sound like a huge um, reduction, but it reduces the infectious period by somewhere around 25%, which reduces the transmission rate. Um, and secondly, it provides us information on targets so that more effective drugs can come along. I certainly expect uh, in the next six months of, of improvements um, in treatments for, so the longer you can stay not infected, the, the more likely um, that first of all, healthcare systems will not be overloaded. And secondly, we will have more information on um, ways to deal um, with, with sick patients. Um, and it will buy us time. Um, I, I, it's very optimistic to think that we'll have a vaccine in the fall. We certainly won't have a vaccine available for mass distribution, but I think there's a reasonable chance we may have one by January that can be fairly broadly distributed. There will be a lot of ethical questions there as to who gets vaccinated first. Um, I, I, I don't want to touch that one right now, but much of what we're doing now is about buying time. I agree that one has to trade this off against the costs of keeping the economy uh, closed or at reduced levels because uh, that can have um, um, effects on morbidity and mortality of, of people as well. Um, but, um, but I don't buy the argument that uh, uh, at all uh, that the way to approach this problem is just to forget about um, all the social distancing uh, and uh, um, and, and let the virus make its way through the population. I think you would have seen, you know, and, and some places you have, just horrendous uh, devastation now, something like the first slide I showed you of the Black Death. So, so following from that um, and continuing this, how, 
what are some of the lessons that you've seen in other systems with subsystems or with multiple interacting systems where you see these concatenation of shocks from one system to another, in this case, of course, from the from health and 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 the the virus itself into the economic system. Well, well we certainly uh, we certainly saw that with the uh, um, with the economic uh, collapse ten years ago, in which um, in, in, in which we saw collapses all in, in all sectors um, of 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 the society. Um, I think you're you're starting to see that now with the number of companies that are going out um, under because of, um, of of the COVID nineteen crisis. The um, um, our socioeconomic systems and our natural systems are beginning become increasingly are becoming and have become increasingly interconnected, uh, and so I um, I, I would. Exp one of the arguments that I and my colleagues have been making is that the loss of biodiversity, the depletion of habitat, um, all of these, uh, the loss of ecosystem services are all going to lead to um, chains of response uh, in, in our societies. Um, the, it's important to think about the differences in discount rates that people look at in uh, addressing these problems, but I've been working closely both with people at the Boston Consulting Group and, and also a colleague who's head of risk management uh, at Prudential Insurance um, in, in New Jersey. And, um, and he's extremely worried about risks that are occurring on the 10 to 20 year time scale. Extremely worried, of course, about some things in the, um, in, in, in the economic system and the financial system, um, like um, the ability to maintain social security, um, the, the national debt buildup, et cetera. But he's also very worried uh, about climate change and doesn't understand why his colleagues uh, are, are not as concerned as he is. It, that uh, over a 10 to 20 year time span, I think you're going to um, you're going to see lots of stresses on our society, stresses, um, uh, uh, some of which uh, are manifest uh, in terms of uh, military um, encounters, in terms of conflicts between uh, nations, but there are going to be economic costs um, to a, a variety of industries. And we're seeing increasing number of uh, Industries starting to worry about these things, um, hedge funds worrying about them, um, the um, the pension fund, what's sometimes called the oil fund, uh, that Norges Bank um, runs. These will be examples of cascading uh, risks that uh, um, that begin to to percolate out of just the biological. So it's very easy. Um, to my lots of colleagues have been working on cascading events in ecological systems, um, like uh, my late colleague Bob Payne at Wisconsin, Steve Carpenter at uh, uh, Wisconsin, on how the collapse of keystone species of top predators can lead to um, chains of collapse um, throughout ecological systems. But I think we're increasingly going to see these um, percolate out from the biological systems into our social and economic systems uh, as people lose their lives, livelihoods, uh, as areas become desertified, as there becomes competition for more resources. Um, and there are those like Tim Lenton, I showed you that one slide of his early on, worrying about um, shifts in global circulation patterns in the oceans and things of that sort. That may or may not happen, but if it does, uh, it would have devastating effects on weather and climate conditions, uh, and from that, um, agriculture and and many other industries. So, uh, I think we need to be very concerned about these chains of um, of response. Simon, this has been a wonderful, enlightening discussion. We want to thank you for very much for taking the time to uh, share with us and and spend with us. Um, 
we uh, hope we can continue this conversation in the future. And uh, thank you again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks all for your questions and for